here we go. All right, slideshow from the beginning. And I'm gonna hide that. Okay, ultraviolet analyzers, 310404F. I'm looking at version 21 again on this one. Can everybody see that? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Here we go. So learning objectives of this is describe the principles of analysis and application of UV analyzers. Describe components of a UV analyzer. Uh, describe precautions and hazards. Obviously, this is this is uh, when we're talking about ultraviolet light. Um, it can be very hazardous. Uh, it can burn. Um, and we'll do that at the end. We'll show you show you what some of the precautions we need to use, and then explain difference between UV absorption and UV emission fluorescent analysis. So we've talked a little bit about this um, fluorescent analysis, where the UV um, is absorbed by well, I'm going to use sulfur dioxide. As it's being absorbed, it gets excited, and as it's not being absorbed, then it loses. Um, it's excite excitation, and it, it uh, basically gives off uh, visible light. So we'll talk about that also on, on uh, objective four. So UV radiation is characterized as electromagnetic radiation. And you've heard that every time. So EMR. And the wavelength here, so we're looking at this uh, wavelength on page three, uh, the UV is 100 nanometers to 400 nanometers. This is the whole UV range. And then you can see on this side is our visible light range. The higher, the, the, the higher energy goes to the smaller wavelengths. If you have smaller wavelengths, you'll have higher energy and, and uh, uh, higher, higher frequencies. So many compounds such as air, carbon dioxide, and water vapor do not absorb UV. So again, there's different compounds that we look at that will absorb UV. And the common one is the SO2. So when we look at these carbon dioxides and uh, water vapors, these are background gases and are ignored. They're obviously ignored because nothing happens. There's no absorption with these. So here's a table on page three. It talks about Ox oxidizing agents. Um, so you got chlorine, chlorine dioxide, ozone. Um, you got sulfur compounds, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, H2S, uh, which we're very familiar with. Um, when we look at SO2, uh, UV, UV analyzers are, are to measure the pollution of the stack gases um, and sulfur recovery plant. When I worked at Suncor, we had a huge sulfury recovery plant because um, that's what we were taking out of the stack. And there was uh, um, there was just actual piles and piles uh, of, of sulfur um, lying on the ground. It was it was encased just in a fencing area or whatever. But um, that sulfur was the brightest of colors of color, and it was pretty pure. Uh, taking it out from the stack gas, it's amazing really how much particulate and, and SO2 is in, in the stack gases. Um, nitrogen compounds, uh, nitro nitrogen dioxide and NO2, pollutants and stack gases. And then we talk about um, aromatic organic compounds and that's your benzene phenols right here and chemical manufacturing. So they're just typical uh, compounds that UV analyzers measure. So UV absorption spectrums generally show one or two broad peaks, unlike IR spectrum, which often shows many sharp absorption peaks. So we, when we looked at uh, the IR absorption peaks, they, uh, they were very um, defined. Uh, but when we look at a peak from uh, UV, it looks like this, and that's on page four. And you can see every one of these little peaks, right, showing different amounts. And then the wavelength of best wavelength is right, right in about here where this peak is. 
this will give you the best readings. So that wavelength is at 280 or something like that. It shows you here. Quality of analysis performed by comparing your maximum analyzer absorption spectrum to a known compound spectrum performed in the lab. So I've got absorbance here. So this is my absorbance, how much it absorbs. And here's my wavelength in nanometers. So that wave looks quite a bit different than a wave from an IR spectrum. So laboratory U, uh, UV spectrophotometers requires a diverse device such as a prism or grating to separate the wavelengths individually for detection. So in this case here, we've talked about this, where you get a UV source, you get a sample cell. Yes, go ahead. So for those uh, non-compound, those uh, chat, do those provided yes. by the manufacturer or is done in your lab? You know what? Um, I say labs, but the manufacturer doesn't know what you're exactly going to use it for. Because if you look at this page here, we could be using it for any of this stuff. So it's our labs. It's our known our labs that have known amounts of these concentrations, whatever we're measuring. Um, and it's 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 something that's fairly typical uh, when you when you get um, a spectrum. So yeah, these are given uh, to us probably by a third or independent party lab. The known the known uh, spectrums. Thanks. When when we measure something, we we always know what we're trying to measure, right? So when we're measuring this, because we know that it's in our say our stack gas, um, we get the uh, the lab uh, spec, and then we compare our spec. Uh, we we take our spectrum and we compare that. All right. So. Laboratory UV spectrometers, photometers, you get the UV source. So with this UV source, we're getting a whole different kind of waves. Um, we shine it through our sample cell, and then I have a grading wavelength selector. So that selector selects one of these waves somewhere here along here for the absorption of what we're trying to measure. So here we'll have a, a grading selector as far as wavelength, and then we get that particular wavelength, and then they get a UV detector, and then of course a signal processor, which basically tells us of the absorbance. And the absorbance is gonna be proportional to the concentration. So wavelength selector selects all individual wavelengths and produces an absorption spectrum of known substances. For example, it would be, you'd see the highest absorption rate of sulfur dioxide at wavelengths between 250 and 330 um, nanometers. And the maximum absorbance is 280. And remember when we saw that one, uh, that spectrum, uh, let me show it back here. I said it was about 280 right there. So I'm looking here, so somewhere around 280 would be, that wavelength would be my maximum absorption. So process UV photometers does not re require a dispersed device. Uses filters to determine absorbent values at specific UV wavelengths of specific components. Again, these are the components, these specific components that we are looking for. If I've, if I've got uh, stack gases or something like that, you know that I'm looking for SO2 for if, if it's burning carbohydrates. So we got a UV source. A UV wavelength selector, we have our sample cell and UV detector. And this is showing here because this UV wave selector, it can be before the sample cell or it can be after. It doesn't matter where this is put. So they're showing you this arrow where my wavelength selected could be here after the sample cell. So in this case here, I've got absorbed UV wavelength. So this is my absorbed UV wavelength. So I'm gonna say 200, 280 nanometers. And this is a, a unabsorbed UV wavelength. So it would be outside either the 280 or what we say 240 to 300. 
it would be outside of that. And that would give me my intensity and it's my, called my intensity reference. My I measured intensity measured is, is measured from how much of the UV is being absorbed. And then you have a lesser measurement. So I measure intensity of measurement. So right here, this detector measures I measure and I reference. And that's how we compare it and, and uh, find out what our spectrum is and how much we have of that component in our sample. Again, here we go for the absorbance. Absorbance equals a log of I reference divided by I measure. And that is in your formula sheet for sure. So if there is no absorption of the measured wavelength, so basically A is equal to zero, which means that the measured compound is not found. So for example, if I'm going to <clears throat> do a, in this case, if I'm going to uh, do a zero cal, I would just put in um, some sort of gas, zero gas that didn't have any, uh, any of the component that I'm trying to measure and I'd get a zero. So I'd have I measure, I'd, I'd reference of 100% divided by I measure with 100% and the log of 100 minus 100 is zero. So my ab absorption would be zero. I, I, at the end, we talk a little bit about a, a calibration. So here's my wavelength, here's my absorption, and here's my UV wavelength, and they're between 100 and 400, so this would be the whole spectrum. In this case, this wavelength is here, about 260, thereabouts. So the, uh, uh, what would be an ideal wavelength, an ideal reference wavelength for phenol? So if I was looking for phenol with a UV spectrum below, what would, what would be my best wavelength? Well, where I have my most absorbance, because my absorbance goes on the vertical, and the horizontal is my wavelength, I would look here and if wherever my peak is, straight arrow down, right down to here, would be my best wavelength to use. So the ideal measured wavelength is right here at the peak. And these are the wavelengths that we can use as our reference. So they're UV wavelengths. So I would get the intensity of this because no, I know that between 100 and 200, that this phenol which does not absorb this wavelength or from 300 to 400 I could use. So that would be, uh, uh, this would be my reference wavelengths, whichever one I choose. And this is my ideal wavelength, which I would get the mass, maximum absorption uh, in my sample cell. So again, either side of this spectrum, 200, 300 to 400 could be my reference. <clears throat> and it says, would a UV spectrometer or UV photometer be able to determine the absorbance spectrum below? The UV photometer is designed for single component analysis using line emission UV sources. Now we have to remember back in when we were talking about emission sources and spectrum sources or, or dispersed sources, when we talk about these UV um, em, um, emission sources, they are uh, uh, the gas lamps, the UV, the metal halide, the, all the gas lamps. They're not filaments. The filaments give a disperse. This, uh, these UV sources give um, line emission, which very few frequencies. Here's our absorbance is equal to log of I reference, so the I measure. So I is light intensity. Here's an example. There's actually three examples in your book. So you can work through those examples if you want, but I took, I chose the third one. It says a UV analyzer used for measuring chlorine concentration in water is calibrated with a solution of one microgram per liter. If the absorbance measures the analyze, um, if the absorbance measured by the analyzer is 0 0.58, and that's our absorbance, which is A. What is the constant value, absorptivity, and path length? So the reason I picked this one is because um, the absorptivity of my compound, and uh, we're looking at chlorine, always stays the same. And the path length, 
always stays the same. So what we're looking for is concentration. So I can add that path length and the absorptivity of chlorine, and I can make that into a constant. And I'll show you. Um, I'll show you what this. And this is the uh, one of the typical um, explanations in your in your ILM. So we know absorption is equal to A B C. So A absorptivity, B is your uh, sample cell length, and C is your concentration. So here it says A B will stay the same because once absorptivity of chlorine, it stays the same because it um, it has an absorptivity. The column distance or length never changes. We don't we don't change out our sample cell column, right? And that'll stay the same. So we call this C. So I can replace this C with this AB. So I don't want you to get confused on that, but it's just saving a step. So therefore, A is equal to constant times concentration. Because I've changed that, I've 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 introduced a C also here because it, it says a constant. So my constant is A, and, and this is transformed. So here, so my constant is A divided by my concentration. So absorptivity divided by concentration. Using the constant value determined from above, what is the concentration of chlorine when the analyzer measures an absorbance of 0 0.348? And here's our here is our formula for that. So when you see this in your ILM, it's just it's just because we've used this AB as a constant. And I didn't want to get I didn't want you guys to get confused by that. There'll be a couple of questions that are definitely with uh, the absorption formula. Fairly easy to, and it's in your uh, formula sheets. Process ultraviolet analyzer applications. What are we looking? What are we doing these for? For three important environmental monitoring applications, environmental stack gas monitoring, uh, sulfur compound gas monitoring in sulfur plants, and bleach monitoring in pulp mills. So when we have this environmental stack monitoring and sulfur plants and bleached uh, pulp mills, we will definitely have UV analyzers. UV analyzer commonly used for source monitoring stack gas for PPM, parts per million concentrations of acid rain, which is SO2, and NOx. So NOx is equal to what? It's uh, uh, nitrogen oxide and nitrogen dioxide. Both those added together are called NOx. So ambient air environment analyzers measures these substances in parts per billion concentration in surrounding areas. And we talked about this as far as where we're going to put these analyzers uh, outside of a plant area. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, in these cases, the UV fluorescent, SO2, and chemiluminescence, NOx, are commonly used. Um, and these get down to parts per billion. So UV fluorescence. And I, I talk a little bit about UV fluorescence at the end. Um, we, talk, we already had mentioned it. Um, in spectroscopic analyzers and chemiluminescence and where we where we measure NOx. So we'll be doing that next week. So these are the ambient air environment analyzers that we talked about where there'd be, you know, a mile from the plant, two miles from the plant. Uh, more normally uh, in the prevailing winds, there'd be more of these analyzers uh, in the direction of the prevailing winds. So with this UV analyzer, SO2, NO, and NO2 pollutants, measures the following sample types. In situ, we've talked about that, where <clears throat> there is no sample system to pull away. So what we do is we have a UV beam here, and we have a cell sample cell right here. So that's in situ. It's right in the stack gas. So the UV source wavelength selector and detector are after it, but there's no sample system that pulls this out. It's in situ. The other one extracting hot, wet samples. 
of course, here we go with our sample system. So we take it out. We've got a heated line or whatever we were trying to do. Uh, we've got a heated line. we got heated filters. we got heated line again. Then we got hot, wet gas UV analyzer. Um, these aren't as accurate as the in situ because we have sometimes we have failure or error in our sample system. So extractive cool dry sampling. Again, uh, this is extractive, but I've got a pump here, a dryer, air filter. And this is all on page 10 and 11. So we've seen this before, so we kind of understand what we're talking about. Um, measurements made on a dry basis are higher than a wet basis. Concentration. So stack gas is often reported on a dry basis. So we've talked about this before. So when we when we do these measurements and we send them into the government, uh, we take we talk about using a dry basis. And the reason the dry bases are high concentration is because we've gotten rid of the water. Sulfur compounds and tail gas units. So ultraviolet analyzers measures H2S, SO2, carbon disulfide, carbonyl sulfide, and monitor the tail gas control on a sulfur recovery unit, SRU. This is on page 12. So it talks about, in this case, we have uh, H2S refinery hyd hydro treaters and gas plants. I got the H2S. It comes into the sulfur recovery unit where I, it, I take the sulfur out of the H2S. Um, I've got my H2S, SO2. I've got all my compounds that I'm measuring or analyzing are sent down to the UV analyzer. And then, I, of course, I have the tail gas and I pump push that all back out and it goes back into the sulfur recovery. We had this at Suncor, but I've, I never did work on this analyzer, the sulfur recovery. I couldn't, I couldn't stand the smell, so I stayed away from it as much as I could. So sulfur vapor must be removed before going into the analyzer. So in this case here, um, this, I have to remove all the vapor. So the sulfur recovery unit would do that for me. So here's a uh, pulp bleach monitoring example. So I have chlorine and chlorine dioxide right here. So I got chlorine dioxide, which I generate here. And then of course I've got ozone. All these three, chlorine, chlorine dioxide and ozone are bleaching agents. So we use those in, in our pulp mill to whiten the fibers. And because we uh, whiten the fibers, we have to analyze for chlorine dioxide, chlorine and, and uh, ozone. So we have the generator. We need this generator. And then we have a gas analyzer for how much we have. And it's a UV analyzer. We pump this. Uh, chlorine dioxide into the absorption tower and we add water. So now we have a solution. So we also have a, 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 li a liquid solution that we use an UV anal analyzer for. This goes into the um, chlorine di uh, dioxide storage tank. Uh, we got a scrubber and then we got a vent gas. So when we scrub, uh, what we're doing is we're, we're scrubbing all of this out of there so we can actually vent it. And when we, uh, according to the environment, we have to put an analyzer on here to measure this chlorine dioxide because we don't want to be pumping that into the air. So this uh, CLO UV solution, again, we've got an analyzer. So it comes out of this tank. And then we send all of this to the, beach the bleaching plant. So you, UV analyzers monitor and control the chlorine dioxide gas being produced. Chlorine dioxide is explosive, so it's dissolved into the water. So this is the one of the reasons that we actually put it in water here in the absorption tower is because chlorine dioxide is explosive. UV analyzers monitor and control CL or chlorine dioxide solution concentrations. <clears throat> 
I've never worked in a pulp plant. UV analyzers monitor and control uh, chlorine dioxide vent gas concentrations. So again, here, when I'm venting, um, I'm, I have to make sure that um, I'm within the limits or the plant is within the limits. So there's your first learning objective. Second one is describe the components of the UV analyzer. Um, they're common to what we used to, uh, what we're used to. Uh, so all UV analyzer contain the following components: a UV source, a UV sample cell, UV wavelength selector, UV detector, and the readout device or the control device. So. You've, we've all talked about these, and when we talk about these again in this in this ILM, uh, you'll you'll recognize some of the wording that we use. So here, non-disperse, few wavelengths of UV. So if it's non-dispersed, I only have I have a few wavelengths that I have chosen, and analyzes specific or few compounds. So I don't have a broad spectrum of wavelengths. I have, it's non-dispersed, so I have selected wavelengths. Dispersed means a wide range of wave, wavelengths. So analyzing all UV absorption sample co compounds. So we can also have that. So we can, if we have a dispersed, which is a wide a range of these wavelengths, then we can analyze more samples, different compounds. So UV sources require a source that produces a few specific UV wavelengths. Uh, we have a UV wave selector, filters to select a few specific UV wavelengths, and we have UV detectors, photodiodes, photomultipliers, um, well, photomultiplier tubes. We've talked about these two, so we'll talk about them again, and that measures UV radiation intensity. And then Disperse UV analyzers, uh, it requires a source that produces a broad range of UV wavelengths. Use the grading selector. And we remember we talked about this grading selector. We'll, we'll turn that to select the, the uh, broad range and specific wavelengths we want. And here for detector two, we have photodiode array. This one here, we haven't talked about, but we've talked about the photodiode, but this is an array. So this is an intricate circuit, and I'll show you how that works uh, later on in the ILM. So the photo di uh, uh, diode array converts the intensity of, and of multiply, multiple wavelengths into multiple electronic signals. So non-dispersive uses two types of UV sources, so line emissions. So uh, line emissions, again, are specific wavelengths given off. And metal, metal halide vapors. And we talk about this one as hollow cathode lamps. So they're, they're vapor lamps, both of them are vapor lamps. And we'll talk about that also. Line emission, specific UV wavelengths, metal vapor lamp, lamps, and that's what these look like here. So you, uh, this is on page 14 to 16. You have your electrodes here. You have your mercury vapor gas in here, or mercury or a blob of mercury, and then your outer quartz envelope. Uh, with quartz, we don't, we can't use glass on these bulbs. We have to use quartz because glass will absolutely absorb the UV rays, but quartz won't. So pass the high volt, high electric discharge through the metal vapors and mercury vapor and the most common for UV source wavelengths that are line emission and hollow cathode lamps. Same principle, uh, hollow cathode. It uses a quartz window. Um, it has two the two electrodes and then the UV radiation goes through here. 
So high voltage electric discharge strikes a, a hollow metal electrode, which is your cathode, which produces metal vapor. So I'm just telling you with the hollow cathode, you can use magnesium or cadmium metal vapors. So that's line emissions. So these line emissions give off very, very few wavelengths, specific wavelengths. This continuous source, it's a wide array. <laughs> and there's only one um, deuterium arc lamp that we use for continuous source. Again, it looks very similar, um, but it's a deuterium arc lamp. And that's on page, I think, 16. When electric arc passes through deuterium, it emits a continuous spectrum of UV light. And here's your continuous source. So you're going to get a whole bunch of wavelengths from, uh, from the deuterium arc lamp. All source lamps use quartz glass because it does not absorb UV rays like ordinary glass would. We don't want to be absorbing any of these rays. We want the highest intensity we could have. Typical have, uh, typically have quartz windows. Uh, so this is going to be our sample cell. And we talked about this sample cell in a previous where the length of my sample cell, in this case here, is doubled only because of mirrors. So my sample comes in here. My sample goes all the way through here. I shine my radiation in here. It hits these mirrors and shines through this again. So I've doubled my sample cell length by having this type. My sample comes in and then my sample goes out and I have my, this will be my path. Um, the length of the path for um, absorption, I don't know if you guys remember, but if I can get an absorption of 0.5, uh, that is the best as far as the cell length. If my cell length is too long not to get a point five absorption rate i have to make it smaller or make it longer depending on what i'm doing so again the only difference here when i'm using uv is this is a quartz window quartz window down here and quartz window down here and then i have my mirrors here so the gas comes or the sample comes in and goes out my radiation goes in uv radiation goes in it is deflected here or refract, deflected by the, my mirrors and goes through here. So it just basically gets my sample length larger, longer. Sensitivity is dependent on cell length. So the cell path should be a length that gives sample concentration and absorbance of 0 0.5. If it's less or more than that, then it doesn't work as well. Wavelength selectors, non-dispersive analyzers, interference filter on page 19. So basically this is just a rotating, it's a rotating filters. So this rotates and then I've got interference filters in here. So these are my interference filters. So it removes unwanted UV wavelengths. So it requires a reference and a measure filter. So this would be my reference and this would be my measure filter. The interference uh, filter cancels out unwanted wavelengths and lets measurement wavelengths of choice pass through as well as a reference wavelength. This is a UV, another UV selector, but this is this uh, reflective diffractive grading. And this disperse analyzers use wavelength selectors here again. So what happens here is UV radiation strikes a grating at the same angle, but travels away at different angles depending on the wavelength. So I put in here, here, this reflective wavelength from grooves. So along here, there's all, oh, there's, there's thousands of grooves along here. As these wavelength comes and hits, some of them deflect straight back at 180 degrees. And when they reflect straight back, they cancel out that wavelength. The ones that don't want to cancel out will, will actually um, 
reflect at a different angle. And we talk about constructive or destructive. So reflected wavelengths from grooves in the diffractive grating either strengthen the wavelength of choice, which is constructive, or cancels out wavelengths that are not needed, and that's destructive. And it's done by the angle of the reflective waves. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll move this um, disperse, uh, diffraction grating, uh, they'll rotate it till they get the exact uh, wavelengths that they want. The other ones will cancel out by reflecting back at 180 degrees. The detectors, the three common detectors are UV photodiodes. So we've talked about those. Um, it's a reverse bias diode, has a very high resistance. When the PN type junction uh, is exposed to UV, the diode conducts. A photomultiplier tube uses UV light to a photocathode and dynodes to generate electrons that are collected at the anode for measurement. So it's, it's going to be your current. The last one is UV photodiode arrays. This is the only one we haven't talked about, but it's the same thing as a photodiode, except it's thousands of them. It works on the same principle. So it contains thousands of photodiodes to measure <clears throat> intensities of all wavelengths dispersed by a grating in the dispersed UV analyzer. So let's talk about these. So here's our PN junction, here's our photodiode. Radiation strikes this. Um, it says, yeah, we got a quartz window. So the quartz window doesn't absorb any uh, UV radiation unless it all pass through. The higher the intensity of the radiation, of UV radiation, the more current is gonna flow through here. And here it's saying current is proportional to the EMR intensity. So fairly straightforward. Now, when I have an array of these, it works the same way, except there's many of them. This is a photomultiplier tube. We talked about it before. We get this UV hitting this photocathode. This photocathode releases electrons. And every time it hits these dynodes, it doubles the amount of electrons. So again, we have a current measuring device here. <clears throat> so the amount of current that's flowing through here, 800 volts across this DC. And current's going to be, again, proportional to the amount of UV that comes through. So what's not absorbed after the sample cell? It comes through here. And I have my absorption spectrum or, or transmit transmission. <clears throat> Here's a photodiode array. So again, it's these photodiodes, but there's thousands of them. And it's on an integrated circuit. So you can just stick that onto a printed circuit board. Thousands of photodiodes are placed in an IC board that measures the intensity of all light that the grating disperses through the sample cell. This measures all the UV absorbing compounds concentrations in that sample. All right, am I talking to myself or are we good? I hear you, we're still here. Perfect, we're still good, awesome. Actually, after, after page 23, I should have asked that on page 12 and every every 12 pages. All right, good. We're going, still going. Okay, readout devices again, um, microprocessors. Uh, they take the intensity of the signal and they'll take the intensity of the reference. They'll take the measured and, <clears throat> and well, the log of the measured and the log of the uh, uh, reference. Uh, go through some amplification and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's just a microprocessor. So... You got your reference in here, which is important, and you got your eye measured. So intensity of the reference, intensity of the measured, log amplifier, you get the log of the eye reference, the log of the eye measured, goes into a differential amplifier, and it comes out with this absorbance. It does all our calculations for us. Nothing outstanding here. So designs, yes, go ahead. I had a question, anybody, or is that an accident? Oh, sorry, I, I did not uh, unmute it. For the readout devices, 
do they provide the communication protocols to link to the PLC or DCS? It certainly could be. Uh, in, in, in most cases, like you'll have this, you'll have this right in your analyzer shack. But yeah, there's there's no question that this could be linked to your uh, to your PLC or DCS for sure. You bet. As a matter of fact, they they, they would be on the uh, the, the operator's uh, control board, so they would definitely be linked. And and again, some are standalone, so uh, the ones that are uh, um, way out there uh, doing environmental monitoring, there's got to be guys that go out there and, and check that out. But in the plant, you'd have that back to your back to your DCS for sure. Thanks. You bet. So the designs, split beam UV photometric analyzer, uh, filter wheel or flicker UV photometric analyzer, and photodiode array dispersed analyzer. So the first one, the split beam UV uh, photometric analyzer, Non-dispersive analyzers use a metal vapor lamp that produces line emission spectrums. So in this case here, it's a split beam. So what happens here is you get your metal vapor, which is which is line emission. You have your measure um, of choice. So, so that's going to be your path length that you've cho chosen. Uh, you're going to have your reference. So what happens, it goes through the sample cell, the measured goes to this beam splitter afterwards, it, and then it goes, let's talk about the measurement first, it goes down to a measure filter. So through that measure, um, measure filter, it only allows the measured beam to go through, the, the intensity of the measured measuring beam, and it blocks the reference. On this particular one, if it goes this way, uh, it lets, lets both the measure and the reference uh, UV wavelength go through, but this reference filter, which is right here, will not let that measure filter measure wavelength go through, but it lets the reference go through. So in this case, you have two detectors. You have a reference detector and you have a measure detector. And they have the I intensity of the measure goes to a signal processor and the intensity of the reference goes to a signal processor. So this is a split beam. I don't know which one is the most common, but um, this is this is definitely a split beam. So the reference beam is blocked. Measure the be the measure beam goes to the detector. So the reference beam is blocked, and this one, you get the measure beam is blocked, and reference beam goes to this detector, and then they join into the readout device, the processor. Processor converts the detector signals to absorbance and concentration. So that's how this one works. Detectors for this type of analyzer are usually photo, photodiode or photomultiplier. So flicker wheel or flicker UV photometric analyzer, non-dispersive detector uses a rota uh, rotation wheel to alternate a measure wavelength and a reference wavelength to the detector. Now I've changed this. Uh, this is on page 28 and I kind of changed it because on 28, you have this uh, sample cell and all that kind of stuff down in here. Well, really, it's not two different detectors. It's, it uses the same uh, UV source, has the same wavelengths. It's only one, but this is, this is what happens. This is just turns, right? So I think what they were trying to show you on page 28 when they have this other sample cell here and UV lamp, to me, it looks like there's two of them but there isn't this just rotates so as it rotates uh it's got the reference filter so it lets the reference go through it doesn't let the the uh, measure go through and as it turns then it lets the measure go through and not the reference go through and then on here when nothing's going through it actually blocks it so this part goes up this this thing uh is actually turning and i i did something here let me yeah yeah let me show you so that actually what i'm trying to show you is that this is just turning this photomultiplying tube is the same tube as this one no difference but when it goes to here it gives me a reference signal when it is it blue and when it's red 
it gives me my measure signal and that's all. So this folder multiplying tube uh, detector is there's only one of them too. So I just didn't, I didn't want you to think that there's actually two of the sample cells, two of the lamps, uh, there isn't. So I just did this so it shows you a little bit better. So I've got this <clears throat> the red first and then the blue, the blue first because it's here. And then, then when it's red, then I get the red wavelength through and it goes to the processor. Uh, and it's, it looks like a digital signal. So on the next page, I'll show you. So the signal processor synchronizes to the rotation of the, the filter wheel to identify the reference and the measured intensity signals. So here they are here. So my detector output signal, this is, this is the intensity here. So this is the reference. It'd be the highest intensity because no, no ultraviolet is being absorbed. This is where it blocks it and none of the wavelengths are coming through. And then this is the measured. And then it blocks it again. And then the reference and it blocks it again. So this is, this is the, what you'd get for your spectrum. Absorbance is equal to I reference. So the intensity of the reference divided by the intensity of the measure. So the log of that. Absorbance is equal to log I reference minus the log of I measured. So you could do it that way also. This is the first time this pops up, but I just stay with this one. Again, absorbance is equal to absorptivity. Uh, B is going to be your cell length and C is your concentration. And here's where they put this constant in again, and we'll do a sample here, I believe. So in this case here, I'm going to do a uh, zero calibration. When I do a zero calibration, as I was talking about before, if you put a zero gas in there with no compounds in, your reference and your measured intensities are going to be the same because there's no UV absorption. So this case here, your reference and your measure are the same. So it says during a, a zero calibration detector measure, I reference at 100% and I measured at 100%. What is the absorbance? Well, if we if we look at our log of um, I, intent, I reference over I measured, we'll get 100 over 100, which equals zero. So I get my log of I reference, which is 100%. And my log of I measured, which is 100%, well, we can do that on our calculator and we're going to get zero. So, so here I am now. I'm going to do my span calibration. So here's my span calibration. So uh, I've, I've done a re uh, my I reference is 100%, and my I measured is 30%, and that's the absorption rate. So I look at this formula. Absorbance is equal to the, the log of 100% over 30%. And it gives me a absorbance of 0 0.522, which is really what we want as far as cell length and all that kind of stuff. We want an absorbance of 5.5, around 0.5. So there's a couple of these in, in your ILM that you can just fire through and, and do some examples to get confident that you can do this. When I compare these analyzer designs, page 31, using reference wavelength in both designs compensates for reduced UV lamps as they age. As UV lamps age, and you, you guys know this, um, when we have these metal halides or whatever that are in our plant, after a while they'll, they, they do, they do um, emit less light. Absorption and scattering from particles, Dirty cell windows are a big one. Line voltage that affects detector and signal processing. So filter UV photometers can compensate for changes in detector sensitivity, electronic noise, 
also these analyzers can analyze multiple samples components by having up to six filters on the filter wheel we only showed two we showed the measured intensity of one and and the reference but you can on these reference wheels you can put a whole bunch well not a whole bunch but you can put more up to six filters it says photo array so this is this photo array right here detector so what happens here is it's got to disperse uv wavelengths that come through and it hits this photo array which has thousands of photodiodes on here and it can um, basically measure it's talking about 400 nanometers to 200 nanometers so there's a lot of wavelengths that this can measure so unlike non-dispersive analyzers that can only measure a few components because they're uh, line emissions and the sample photo array dispersed analyzers can measure up all uv absorbing components in the sample so if you have a sample that has a lot of uv absorbing uh, um, molecules or compounds then this is the one we would use performs both qualitative and quantitative analysis all right describe uv precautions and hazards so damaging effects of radiation on living tissue depends on the type of radiation and intensity. Uh, we have UVC, UVB, and UVA, and that's from 100 nanometers to 400, so that's the whole spectrum. So it goes A, B, C backwards there. So these are dangerous rays. Uh, these are burning rays, 280 to 315. And this is what you get when you uh, go to tanning booths you get 315 to 400 nanometers wavelengths. Here's my x-rays down here on the spectrum and here's my visible light. So it's just talking about how dangerous these can be. Uh, my ultraviolet sources, metal vapor lamps such as mercury vapor are the most intense UV sources. Um, hot filaments are at the least. Uh, read and operate a manual to determine the location, type of UV sources, and safety features for the analyzer. And again, anything that the manufacturer says, as far as precautions, that's what you do. The health effects on radiation exposure. Exposure of UV radiation can damage skin and eyes. The amount of damage depends on the factors of the wavelength, whether it be UVA, UVB, or UVC, the intensity, which is energy per uh, uh, centimeters uh, squared um, of exposure to, uh, of exposed tissue, and then duration of exposure. So wavelength, intensity, and duration. You want to stay away from UV light. <clears throat> and if you can't, well, you put on these um, PPEs, containment enclosures with restricted asset, uh, ac access. Interlock source with protective enclosures. Use appropriate warning signs. Personal protective equipment must be worn in exposure to radiation and, and cannot be, that cannot be prevented. The last one, uh, last learning objective number four, explain the differences between UV absorption and UV emission. So when I talk about UV emission, we're talking about fluorescence. We talked a little bit about this in one of the uh, in the spectroscopic analyzers. Fluorescence is emission of a lower energy electromagnetic radiation (EMR), such as visible light from a substance that absorbs higher electromagnetic radiation, such as UV. So here we go. SO2. We get high energy UV. Whatever it absorbs, it gets excited. So at the excitation part, there's no uh, light given off but when it loses that energy it goes back to its normal state it loses that energy and it gives off visible light and then it goes back to so2 which is going to be normal when it's um, hit again with uv then it gets excited and that cycle continues so this low energy is the light that we see so electron energy can be represented by a series of horizontal lines known as energy levels. So when we look at this, this is what it's showing here. So I've got this, I've got this UV at 210 nanometers. I have the excitation of the compound. Then I have the loss of energy of the compound. 
And what it gives is emissions of visible light. So this is sulfur dioxide at energy levels. So it doesn't give off any, it absorbs this, excited, loses it, loses loss of energy. And through that, I get emission of that visible light. So we have an analyzer to measure this, and we have an analyzer to measure that. So here, here it is, sulfur dioxide, you have a, uh, an ultraviolet fluorescent analyzer. Here's your UV lamp. And you get a filter here that only allows 210 nanometers to flow through. It hits the SO2 through the sample cell, quartz, quartz windows, of course. The SO2 gives off visible light. Um, they have a 350 nanometer filter, and it goes down to this, this particular one, which is intensity emitted. Is very sensitive. It's a sensitive photomultiplier tube, so it needs to be cooled because it heats up quite a bit with this 350. The UV keeps going through here, so that's my reference. And this photo, photomultiplier tube isn't as sensitive as this one, so it doesn't need cooling. So 210 goes through here. When I have when I excite this SO2, uh, it, it gets energized. When it loses that energy. It gives off visible light and 350 um, nanometer filter. <clears throat> and it goes down to the sensitive photomultiplying tube. And that's called the intensity of the emitted light. And that's the reference intensity. So with this uh, electronic noise here, this cooling jacket, that's what, it, that's what it's doing is actually getting rid of any, any disturbance, any electronic noise. Second detector measures UV intensity as the source weakens with age. So it actually, because these sources weaken with age, it'll actually uh, compensate for that. And then, of course, both of these are going off to some sort of controller. So interference compound include those that either inhibit or exhibit fluorescence. Ideally, UV fluorescence analyzers should be calibrated with a zero and span gas and have similar uh, composition to the test gas to reduce effects of other molecules. Not saying much there. Uh, comparing fluorescence and absorption, ultraviolet fluorescent analyzers are commonly used to monitor parts per billion. Concentration and absorption analyzers are used for parts per million concentrations. So when I have these ambient air monitoring, I use uh, you ultraviolet fluorescent analyzers because I can get to the parts per billion. If I'm close to the plant, I go parts per, parts per million. Summary, many compounds such as air, carbon dioxide, and water do not absorb UV radiation. UV analyzers are made up of line emission or continuous sources. Cell length affects sensitivity. Filters or gratings are used to select wavelengths. Photodiode, photo multiplier tube, and photo array detectors are used depending on analyzer design. But for UV wavelengths, these are the three. This one is the same as that one, except these ones, there's a whole bunch of them, a thousand of them instead of a few. UV radiation is damaging and proper precautions must be taken to limit exposure. And UV fluorescence can measure parts per billion concentrations. And UV absorptions can measure parts per million concentrations. So that would be important for us to, uh, as I say, when we're looking for parts per, per million, it would be close to the, the or close or it'd be right in the stack. And if I'm looking for uh, parts per billion, these would be your environmental monitors that are, that are distanced from your, your um, plant. All right, finish off your questions 16 to 20 on page 44 of the ILM and we are done ultraviolet analyzers. Are we still there? Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Perfect. I love it. All right. I'm going to stop sharing and stop recording.